Okay, good morning, dear all. We are finally ready to start. Thank you very much for your coming today. So the first uh, part of our event, uh, Resilient Ukraine Tomorrow, like global response to combat Russian disinformation, uh, will be dedicated for uh, mostly networking. That's why we have this uh, family size of, uh, of our team right now. But afterwards, uh, during the second part of our um, event which will be broadcast and uh, we will have it interpreted as well for Ukrainian audience and for the audience abroad. Uh, we'll have more people and we will discuss the exact topics. But right now we will have um, the close talk to Ukrainians who actually uh, used to be the grantees of the Influencers Hub Ukraine, which is a large project by DCN. And uh, this event and the project itself couldn't be possible without the uh, support, very sustainable and close support of our partners who are uh, America House, uh, Kyiv and uh, US Embassy Kyiv Ukraine. And of course, thanks to all the huge DCN team for making everything we, you ha we have today and used to have during the Influencers Hub as well. And first, of course, some welcoming remarks. And uh, I'm sure we're having Tatiana Strelchenka, the head of the America House Kyiv, today with us, but she will be uh, like joining us from Kyiv, I'm sure. And uh, Tatiana, if we hear you well enough, let's start from your speech. And also, still we are waiting, so we will have one more talk from, from the president of the DCN Global, Nikos Panayotou and start with the uh, first panel dedicated, oh, okay, I see myself, uh, dedicated to the projects of the Influencers Hub and our like, guests will tell us what uh, they are doing actually right now because before the 24th of February, February they used to be vloggers, like people who are creating content and doing whatever they would like to do in their professional arena. But the 24th of February a year ago changed everything, just everything. Some people uh, were, f were forced actually to leave Ukraine. Some people stayed and uh, transferred their life to volunteer and helping Ukrainian army, helping people to, I don't know, get uh, to the new reality. And I'm happy to see Tatiana uh, on our screen today. Tatiana, the floor is yours. I think we need to do something else to hear Tatiana uh -huh. a little bit. Well, yeah, the floor is you yours. Can... Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. It's been three years since pandemic you know hit but we're still figuring out this little details hello everyone dear friends colleagues dcn partners uh participants of our influence hub ukraine project i'm so happy thrilled to see you all even on my screen i remember very well how we started this project amidst the pandemic and we continued it. And of course, the biggest challenge was last year, almost a year ago, with the full-scale invasion of Russian Federation. Uh, but we remained undeterred. And thank you, Tisian, for being so exceptional about it. Um, with many of you, dear participants, we met in Odessa in 2021. I remember our conversations. I remember how impressed I was with your projects. Um, media literacy, combating disinformation projects, uh, educational projects, projects with cultural components of how to share a rich Ukrainian culture and history with the world. Um, and in Odessa, we discussed it, and I remember how in my speech, I was talking about a great responsibility of being a digital influencer in 21st century. Today, I think when representing Ukraine, it's still a huge responsibility, but it's also an exceptional, beautiful honor. And I know that as ambassadors of our country, you carry on this honor and you tackle people's hearts and souls with your content, with your articles, with your videos, with your blogs and vlogs. Please continue doing that. Please continue doing this exceptional work. Um, I was thinking about um, us, about Ukrainians, and one word that comes to me when I think about you and, and us, all of us, 
is the word that exists, I think, only in Ukrainian language, and it's hard to translate it in, into any other language with just one word, and this is Zavziatist. And for international partners, I can translate it as a mixture of being undeterred and then broken, but also it's a bravery with courage, but also it is being inspired and lighthearted about challenges. So I just wish you all to continue being Zavziatist, and uh, I'm very sure that it will bring our victory very soon. And just on behalf of America House and the American Spaces Program in Ukraine, I want to remind you about the support we all want to give you. Uh, please rely on us. We just opened America House Lviv in December 2022. Don't be a stranger. If you are in Lviv, stop by. Use our amazing media zone and podcast studio. It's free of charge. You could come, you could create videos, you could create whatever you want, any content, um, it's for you. Uh, we still have America House Key, our flagship America House. And right now we are about to um, conclude renovations for America House of Dasa. I think my colleague Darina is today with you from America House of Dasa. She can tell you much more about it. Please reach out to her and learn more about this project. Hopefully in summer 2023, we are all superstitious this day, so we do not make any deadlines anymore, but still, hopefully, uh, we will open America House of Essa soon for you all. I'm wishing you plenty of good luck. I know that the topic is very um, difficult, especially uh, since the anniversary of the full-scale invasion is so soon. Please stay safe. Please um, stay undeterred, resilient. Uh, uh, thank you all and have a wonderful conversation and conference today. Thank you, Tatiana. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support, first of all. And of course, yeah, this is the really word which can uh, describe everyone staying here right now in our room, Zavziati. This is the probably the, the best description of people who will have the first panel today. Thank you very much again. And we will see you, I'm sure, in our all our different, other different projects. I hope we will have them as soon as possible and even in Odessa and uh, we uh, let me check if we are ready with the other okay so yeah I think we are ready with the other um, speech from greeting speech from our Nikos Panayoto who is DCN global president dear Nikos do you hear me well enough Um, yeah, Nikos, we do hear you and see you well enough. The floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, dear Yulia. Um, I would like to start by underlying the importance that this event has for this end global, but uh, also for the community that has been engaged in the implementation, both the American House as well as the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine. It signifies for, uh, for us a continuation of the work that we have started doing it even be doing even before the program. This and global has been present in Ukraine before the invasion and it will continue to to be with uh, Ukraine all this during a difficult phase but also the day after. For us today's event signifies actually the work that a, it has been done and I would like actually to praise in, um, in that this point the, the work done by Julia, by Asken, by Mariana, by Diana and especially you that have been involved in uh, doing all this uh, project. We're looking forward to continue the cooperation with you and most importantly we are looking forward for the day after. Slava Ukraina. Thank you very much. Heroim Slava. Thank you very much, Nikas. Thank you. I am sure we will have a lot of things to do in Ukraine in the future. So thanks, thanks a lot for this support and your dedication actually to do a change, to do a, a difference, to make a difference in Ukraine.
Okay, dear all, we are ready to continue our conference about the disinformation, actually, uh, all the uh, Russia uh, everywhere in the world and uh, how it is dealing with the Ukraine's, uh, Ukraine situation right now. And uh, we are going to have a very interesting panel right now about the Russian disinformation campaigns globally and how they actually affect the public perception worldwide. And I'm happy to invite our speakers. Some of them are uh, on the ground, some of them are online, but I'm sure we'll have a very uh, good, productive, uh, flourishing even discussion. So the first guest I'm inviting to the stage is Mateusz Mrozek, head of the counter acting disinformation department of NASC. Please invite him. Uh, thank you very much, yeah. The next guest is Agnieszka Britz, Nikolaus Copernicus University, foreign policy expert. And on the ground, one more person we have uh, is Oleg Naumenko, fund coordinator at Alenia International. Take your seat. And as for our online guests, we have Romana Sachuk, the research associate at DFR Lab of Atlantic Council. Thank you for joining us. Also, Thank you. Yeah, also have Walter Lach, the author at Walter Report. Probably you heard, if not, we will do it today. Uh, one more guest is Natalia Guminyuk, the independent journalist and public interest journalism laboratory CEO. Thank you for joining. And the Elspeth, uh, and the project director of Open Information Partnership, Elspeth Southers. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Okay, so we'll probably start uh, with Mateusz about what your research institute is doing. Uh, so the mic is to travel, Oleg, to, to Mateusz, thanks a lot. Thank yeah, uh, please make sure it is uh, switched on. Test one, two, three. Perfect, thank you very much. And uh, you are representing actually the research institution under uh, President Cancellaria, if, if it, I don't know how to translate it well enough. Not, not accurate, uh, okay. we are National Research Institute, which is, uh, NASC is uh, National Research Institute, uh, which cover some part of cybersecurity area in Poland, some uh, um, important uh, um, area. Uh, one of the part of this uh, uh, is, is also disinformation. Uh, my department was established uh, at uh, the beginning of 2022, mm -hmm. but a uh, group of people which are which are in in, in my team and myself uh, is concentrate about the disinformation um, uh, since the. COVID-19 pandemics and the uh, COVID vaccination process against the, the, the COVID-19. So we are quite experienced and we are uh, taking approach to being as close as it possible to the real time, to being close to the real user, to explain how the disinformation works, what the informational operations are going in the, our infosphere. And we are monitoring and reporting the, this harmful content to um, to the public bodies and to the to the users to build up awareness of the situation. Since we have today the emerging leaders, actually bloggers, content makers who would like to continue their way, and uh, of course most of them will cover the situation in Ukraine, uh, Russian-Ukraine war, and uh, will be asking for further support of the international audience worldwide. Uh, as for Poland, actually, so you've seen and you've analyzed a lot of uh, disinformation campaigns going here. Uh, what are probably the uh, insights you've got during this year of your analysis? Because if your department was established just before the invasion mm -hmm. uh, like of Russia to Ukraine, so you had a very <laughs> hard time during <laughs> this year, for sure. Uh, what are the main narratives? And uh, what are your probably... Um, uh, suggestions, any kind of advice or tips, what can we from our part and the content makers mm -hmm. uh, from Ukraine and even uh, of Ukrainians who are living worldwide and creating content worldwide, what can be done more or what can be done else to sustain this support? You know, uh, I think uh, the, the main situation is that the we can learn much from your side, not to uh, be an, uh, teachers for you, because you are the front line now. You are the, the uh, people which are uh, at war. 
mainly. Not only in infosphere, but at the at the field. So uh, uh, we uh, we uh, looking about your effort, about your uh, your approach, um, uh, and we are looking worldwide. The whole um, um, the whole conflict is uh, is uh, looking by your eyes. So you are successful in the in the counteracting disinformation at the worldwide level. And also when we see the consolidation, the morale of the people from the Ukraine, so um, you are the winners now, for now. There, there is the, uh, the, the um, not the, the whole war is, is uh, over, but the, the battles are uh, at, your, at your side. You are winning the, the battles. Uh, from my point of view, we are near to the being front line and we have a different approach of the disinformation at our infosphere. So, uh, in fact, the, uh, the most of the harmful narratives which we see um, uh, since the, the, the uh, 24th of February 2022 was aimed to divide uh, the, the, the people in Poland and the Ukrainian refugees. Um, th th there is not the, that many uh, harmful, uh, harmful narratives when w than we think. There is only four of them, in the fact, in, in, when we group it in the bigger scale. And the, the threats are, are um, uh, threats are more multiply uh, in, in our infosphere. There is maybe 600 of the threats in these four areas. But um, the main goal was the, to uh, show the refugees from Ukraine as the criminals, as the disease spreaders, uh, as, the, um, as the people which are uh, taking our jobs, uh, taking our social system, and so on and so on. Uh, also, the, our tough history are, uh, are, are exploited in the... Uh, in these narratives, the, the Wojnia massacre, which, uh, which are sensitive in Poland, in some part of Poland, we are uh, quite sensitive in that, uh, that way, are also exploited uh, in these narratives. Uh, we saw that the, uh, for internal uh, uses, usage, um, uh, Russians wanted to show the supporting Ukraine is anti Polonism in the fact because the um, uh, we uh, Poland at war will be al always losing this uh, this kind of situation so supporting Ukraine so um, being close to the war is anti Polonism because uh, we we lose this this fu future war if if uh, uh, if they if the, that war uh, brings to the Polish borders. And so this is the second internal one. And the, the second part was the external usage. So um, uh, the, the Russians wanted to uh, show Poland are the troublemaker of this part of Europe. So in the fact, they are wanted to show that you, uh, Poland pushes the Ukraine to um, being at this war still. And this is, the, um, this is also the... Be, um, the, the, to showing the Poland are um, abusing Ukraine to to fight for the uh, uh, American war, the NATO war, because the, at the other side, the NATO and Americans are the equal uh, equal wording. Uh, so this was the, this was the second, uh, the first of the, the that's uh, the first narratives of the second sphere, and the fourth one. The second in the second sphere is that the, to show the Poland are uh, without any alliances uh, in in the real world. We are alone in the in that war, uh, in the in that probably future uh, further war. So uh, my point of view is that the we must uh, be still. Uh, we, we must be together uh, between our two nations because uh, the understanding of the environment which we are in are, are crucial. Uh, maybe our history are tough. We we know that the, both sides have some uh, some suggestion for the suggestions for the other side. I'm the historian, so I know quite well that the the the, the history are complicated. But we must build about the future, our common future, our common, um, uh, common 
our common future are, are crucial for this part of Europe. If we, uh, if we will be uh, put the, the some things in truth after the war, not now. There is no there is no time to exploit the, that that hard hard things. We we have a bigger thing to to deal with it. But uh, uh, the the my main message to you is to avoiding fatigue uh, in the both na nations. Poles are also uh, fighting by the, that this war. We 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 made a big effort to um, to uh, guesting to hosting the the refugees from Ukraine, um, uh, and this is the this is the main field when the Russian disinformation are um, are dangerous because uh, the, the the Russian disinformation are not uh, so dangerous in the first few weeks, days, or months of the uh, informational operation. They are most uh, effective after some months when the people are looking for their real lives, they are concentrated of their businesses and for their, um, uh, for their living uh, situation. They are not starting the day to see at the TV, is the Kiev still standing? Because this is the this is the reminiscence of of the of the past. The, today I must think about the inflation, about um, about uh, shopping and so on and so on. So the the Ukrainian war are quite uh, quite uh, um, after them. So this is the 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 the, the field which we uh, which we must uh, stand still and we we must uh, remember about the. Uh, about the wording uh, in the both sides. We are also grateful for you, but because the, you are also fighting for our freedom, for our independence, we understand that when we are grateful for you. Um, uh, and so the, the word thank you is the very crucial word between these two, two nations now. Uh, and the understanding that the uh, situations which we see in, in the infosphere are also influencing about the Sphatic people uh, in the uh, at the Warsaw, Łódź, Rzeszów, and so on. So we must understand that the the at the the big scale uh, and the, in the smaller scale there are similarities in in uh, in uh, uh, our doing. Thank you, Matej. It's very thought-provoking, actually, what you've told. And one more very quick question. Do you have any other suggestion uh, what to deal with this kind of a narrative about the refugees? Because it is uh, kind of obvious that the refugees are gone as soon as the war is over. So what probably could we focus on uh, in this situation to counter counteract, actually, this narrative in Poland? At the government level, there was the powerful hint uh, at the at the middle of the November, at the 11th of November in Poland is the Independence Day. Uh, it it was the day when the when the, um, we saw at the social media many videos from the um, Ukrainian officials, which was. Uh, with the best wishes for the uh, Polish Independence Day, and also uh, the, the, the videos was full of grateful for the uh, for the behavior of the Poles at the general level, not only the the uh, authorities but also the uh, simple simple Poles at the uh, at the at the smallest cities or or, or, or in the villages. So. In effect, that kind of, of uh, communication actions which we can take at the um, organic level, you know, the, uh, from, from the influencers level to, to um, encourage to, to build some hashtag which, which showing us the uh, community between the Poles and Ukrainians at the, at the smart level. We, we don't know, we don't want to build a, a one nation. We don't want to build one, we'll build one country. Country. We must, um, we must, uh, to, to being uh, accurate, to being um, effective against this information, we must talk about the things which are quite simple in the, in the basics. That we understand each other, that there is no room to be being divided in the, 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 that, um, uh, that narratives. They are building about bad emotions. And we must build good emotions. We must show good examples of, of the 
uh, of the, our cooperation. We, we provided that at the beginning of the conflict when the, um, uh, the, the mass of the people flooded uh, ahead our borders from, from, from your side, from the Ukrainian side. Um, the uh, Russian side provides uh, provides under hashtag Africans in Ukraine uh, this information operation about yeah. the inhumane track, uh, inhumane actions which were taking for the people outside from from the outside the Europe, which was at the be at the beginning of the conflict at the Ukrainian side. So we uh, saw that we was prepared because. Um, the, the whole situation started uh, half years earlier at the Polish-Belarusian border when they provide the, uh, the, the point of view that the Poles are, are, um, are racist and, and, and treated inhumane the, um, uh, the, the, the people at the Polish-Belarusian border. And they build up the point of that, that uh, build up that uh, background for the sensitive groups uh, of the western world which was uh, which was um, um, which was sensitive for the human rights and and, and humane track, uh, actions for for the people so they wanted to build the, this this uh, this point of view uh, and they use it at, at the, after the beginning of the conflict and we um, uh, we we was prepared, like I said, and we provide to 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 the InfoSphere a website, the Poland First to Help, which shows the real uh, real stories of the real people from that side, which crossed the border and being grateful and thankful for the Ukrainian and the Polish um, border officials, um, which was grateful to to pass uh, to pass uh, the border. So, in fact, this is the way which we should think about to debunk, to counteract this information. Uh, the, 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 there is no, the, 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 this is not a complication for, uh, for our basic work. We, we should think about this, it's simple, and we, we should um, uh, compare the simple words, like thank you, like being grateful, like being beware, being still. It's, it's, it's quite, quite simple, like I said. Thank you very much. We will talk about it a little bit later with Agnieszka, but now we're switching to our colleagues online. And I would like to hear from Romana Sachuk from the DFR lab today. And uh, um, so the DFR lab of Atlantic Council was doing a great job um, while monitoring the social media worldwide during the elections and uh, uh, different situations, including hostilities, something like that. And also they were monitoring uh, the military situation in Ukraine starting from the year 2014. So there was um, at least Michael Sheldon who was monitoring uh, the dislocation of Russian forces and he was the person to prove that Russian forces are there in, in Ukraine, but not the so-called, you know, the proxies and whatever. I will not mention them at all. Roman, what is actually the focus of DFR Lab right now? What are you doing? And is Michael Sheldon still searching for Russian grads in Ukraine? Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. And yeah, uh, thank you for the question. So quickly, I'll answer the second one. Michael is still researching Ukraine, but uh, unfortunately for us, unfortunately for Bellingcat, for as a part of Bellingcat team, uh, we have other researchers who are doing this uh, on our own behalf. So what we are focusing now, we are doing uh, the thing called Russian War Report. We started this thing even before the invasion when we tracked uh, the movement of military troops uh, and the buildup near Ukrainian border. Then. Also, we looked at the different narratives and false flags of operations that Russians are trying to um, maintain and uh, conduct to um, justify the invasion. And since uh, the invasion, we started doing this thing not weekly, but uh, a few times per week, like three times a week. Now it's back to a weekly format. Actually, next uh, week uh, on Wednesday will be presenting a report uh, which will consist of two parts. One of them would be focused on what Russian sources told uh, about and what kind of narratives they used prior to the invasion. 
and the second part will focus on how they change their tactics after the invasion uh, in uh, multiple places around the world, uh, including Russia itself, Ukraine, uh, European countries, Africa, and South America as well. So that's what we're focusing. We are closely following what's happening uh, with the conflict, what Russia is trying to promote on different parts of the world. And yeah, uh, looking closely in both um, enact uh, capabilities and opportunities and what they are doing on the ground and also focusing on uh, the things that they're doing in the digital and media sphere elsewhere. Roman, so of course you saw this research you're talking about, it, which we are anticipating like in several weeks, or if even no, so uh, the only, and uh, I don't know, the common question um, I will ask everyone today is uh, about what are the main insights of the year you've seen dealing with all this disinformation stuff from Russia. And uh, what are your suggestions, actually, how to counteract them, how to, because they are always changing their strategy, and uh, it is obvious they do. So what should be done, for, uh, in your opinion, uh, not even for us as Ukrainians, as bloggers, content makers, and journalists, whatever, but uh, even, even, I don't know, in media, what should we do and what should we be aware of? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, I will quickly stop on the tactics that we spotted this year. I mean, as you said, they're constantly changing, but that's really interesting how they evolve past uh, some limitations and some bans like in European countries, for instance, right, of their regular um, outlets like RT and Sputnik. So um, first of all, they uh, employ the things like the post fact checks, they produce tons of different forgeries and false flag operations um, to overinflate information space with multiple explanations of what's happening. So it's kind of not new at all. Uh, they use this with the MH17, they use it with the Skripal poisoning and many, many other things. So the only like, I would say novelty this time is that uh, they use this uh, fact checkers toolbox uh, with their war on fakes thing when they try to um, quote unquote scientifically debunk false stories, uh, but uh, we at least they try to promote their own false stories, like they try to deny uh, the bombing of uh, maternity hospital in uh, Ariupol, they try to deny Bucha massacre because they looked into the video and told that uh, there were like people moving around when in reality it was just some glitch of the video, so something like this. And um, the second thing, they actually create their disinformation towards specific region, uh, meaning that uh, the one uh, size doesn't fit all. They are looking into what are the most probable things that will uh, be gratefully uh, perceived in a specific region, meaning that, um, let's say, uh, they would promote anti-Americanism and like multipolar view of the world for the people who are like critical towards the United States, for instance, or uh, in Africa, they would use uh, some explanations of some things that actually directly impact the people there. For instance, they promoted stories that Africa would, uh, would face famine simply not because there is no grain or because Russia is bombing Ukrainian capabilities and Ukrainian fields uh, with the grain, but because uh, European Union and European countries are taking this grain and not sharing it with uh, African countries. Meaning that they are trying to kind of transform their messages and craft it specifically for specific regions. Um, and finally, they are trying to undermine both Ukraine and Western resolve uh, on what people trying to help Ukraine, right? So they are like trying to promote false stories uh, about the Ukraine, for instance, it's selling weapons uh, that West is donating in order to portray Ukraine as a bad actor that is not worth uh, Western help and trying to promote that um, Ukraine uh, actually should not receive any help. And they're doing it again. In uh, multiple countries, they're doing it different, right? They would be uh, using the forged documents that uh, appear in some obscure Telegram channels, but then uh, move to some, let's say, Twitter or some other spaces that are not directly connected to Telegram or the first source in the first place. So the disinformation would then jump around uh, into multiple information spaces, multiple languages would be translated by some conspiracy leaning people uh, and some fringe audiences and will even uh, might actually reach some 
mainstream media as well. So as you um, asked, like uh, the second part of it, right? What to do with that? Well, I think that first of all, we need to continue to bring truth to the surface. We need to explain what's happening on the ground, but not with some, I don't know, just uh, just explanation. We need to provide some evidence, right? We need to uh, show what's happening with, with the footage. We need to show uh, and tell the stories of the real people on the ground, what they're facing. And we at that, we could actually uh, deny those falsehoods that are um, Russians are trying to promote. Secondly, we need to actually collect, debunk, and expose uh, the falsehoods, right? So we need to find those instances where some specific actors are amplifying them, and we need to actually collect this information, share this information, and explain why this is wrong, right? In a step-by-step -step approach, uh, in in the faith that those actors will, um, you know, change their behavior, or uh, they would just stop. Uh, spreading the disinformation. And as I said, like we kind of need to use the same approach as Russian are doing, but not in the sense that promoting false information or promoting uh, some uh, lies. We need to understand that one size doesn't fit all. And we need to, uh, like, if we talk about the influencers, right? So, like, the mostly uh, audience is consistent of them. Uh, you probably need to craft your messages again for different regions and for different uh, target audiences. But again, I, I guess you already know that, but it's just meaning uh, that the target audiences, uh, they should be even uh, separated in specific countries, right? So when you're targeting a country, it's not like uh, homogeneous, right? Source, it's uh, heterogeneous. There are different groups and you always need to understand that at least some part of the society will not be uh, receptive and uh, perceiving your message positively, so you should always craft and change those messages to be most effective in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roman. And we are anticipating your research, actually. It will tell us a lot, and we will see actually what, what, what exactly to, to, to curb, what exactly to counteract in the information space. Thank you for your, uh, what are you doing, actually, for Ukraine. And I would like to switch to Walter Lech as well. Uh, Walter, if you hear us, please uh, uh, give us a sign or whatever. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So uh, I will tell a couple of words about Walter and um, actually uh, pass the floor to him. So this is the person who uh, created the Walter Report. Um, this is not only the uh, web page uh, dealing with all the uh, news from Ukraine, but also the uh, Twitter spaces 24-7 uh, on the situation on Ukraine really for half a year if I'm not mistaken. So Walter, tell us please uh, what was the idea of, uh, of creation <coughs> such of the, I don't know, intensive communication. And of course in US you are truly uh, seeing what is going on in terms of effectiveness of Russian propaganda. So probably you could name uh, some examples and also advise us how to deal with it. The floor is yours. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you for the panel, uh, an excellent one. And indeed, uh, I started Walter Report um, inadvertently, I reckon, because I've been doing these Twitter spaces, which were proliferating. Uh, or let me, one second. I think Perfect. this works. And now we see you. Perfect. Yeah. All right. So the Twitter spaces and uh, stuff on Twitter uh, was proliferating and was essentially driven uh, to a significant extent by, the, by Russian propaganda before the war started as and one year ago as the build up of Russian forces was in process. So the propaganda was also rampant online. And, uh, you know, on a volunteer basis of sorts, I started doing the space myself. And on the 24th uh, February, when the full-scale invasion started, it essentially became viral and uh, never did stop for essentially 150 days. We transmitted 24-7. The other people joined who volunteered. It became a group effort, uh, essentially organized by me. And um, that was the thing. That was the world to report. So the idea was to essentially convey the notions of about what is happening in Ukraine, told by Ukrainians from Ukraine. We had people who were um, essentially 
on the front line who were in the cities in the process of being bombed. We plugged them in and we provided that to the Western audiences. And we cut off all the Russian attempt to influence that or override that. And uh, as you said, indeed there were, and there still are, because they are proliferating Russian attempts to imitate that thing and uh, to act in the information sphere, specifically on Twitter and on Twitter spaces. It's still very much a thing. Um, initially, in February one year ago, it started from proliferation of so-called anonymous OSINT accounts, uh, which were actually, some of them started to portray themselves as if they are pro-Ukrainian, but they were also injecting soft Russian propaganda points, and they still are. So the ostensible image of being pro-Ukrainian doesn't essentially convey the actual a reality of the things that are there. Uh, these anonymous accounts managed, unfortunately, to grow. Some of them managed to gain significant audience. Uh, they still parasite uh, actively on the audiences and try to convey these um, well harmful messages. The other thing which I perceive personally like even more dangerous and perilous uh, in regards of Russian disinformation is proliferation of so-called fake Ukraine supporters. Uh, also anonymous accounts uh, who declare themselves, um, you know, they put Ukrainian flag in their profile. They declare themselves as Ukraine supporters, um, but it's not the genuine support. It's an imitation of support. Um, also essentially organized by nefarious actors and uh, curated by Russian uh, benefactors of such things. So uh, these so-called Ukraine supporters, they also run uh, Twitter spaces. They organize online communities. Um, the thing that they are trying to do, and they actually unfortunately succeeded in doing, uh, they themselves essentially uh, also inject soft Russian propaganda points. So it depends on the level of uh, of how intricate they are. It might be like, I don't know, 70, 30 percent, it can be 95 and 5 percent, uh, but it's still the same pattern. Uh, they prep the stage, they prep the background, and when the audience is tuning in, pro-Ukrainian audience of somewhat gullible people uh, who have hard time discerning what actually is going on, these so-called Ukraine supporters which are nefarious actors hiding under our flag, wrapping themselves in our flag. Uh, with such background and already fertile ground, they have uh, an option to inject soft Russian propaganda points, which was one thing that they do. They also platform and legitimize bad actor because they already have an active audience of people who are tuning in and listening. Therefore, they can elevate and create a semblance of credibility for people who essentially they try to elevate and promote, which also are bad actors, but for the audience, they are portrayed as, again, Ukraine supporters. Um, and they prep the ground continuously for something even more ominous in the future, because the audience is already listening on sometimes on 24 seven basis. There is such one space online on Twitter, which declares itself as a uh, pro Ukraine, but it's just the opposite. And uh, this is where the danger actually is. Um, Peter, could, what, what, what can be actually done with what you've witnessed? So can we do anything else? Can we do something contrary? Can we run again the Twitter spaces to, I don't know, uh, compete with them or do anything else to just show the difference and show that something is wrong with other side? Well, it should be done. It's just the challenging part because these things, even though they declare that they are run by volunteers, they are highly organized. Uh, we were running on volunteer basis, essentially. Essentially, we were running on fumes to a certain extent. These things, uh, they have support basis 
and declaration of being volunteer. In reality, they are vertically organized, structured. They also, what they are trying to do, essentially take the oxygen from everything else, pollute the information sphere with their presence or 24 seven presence, and therefore, you know, isolate other actors, good actors who try to kind of prove the narratives that they are trying to inject. What can be done? Well, first of all, the audience should be aware that Ukrainians should not be um, detracted from or essentially cut from their own agency. So as usual, nothing about Ukraine without Ukrainians. Things which are run uh, by people who declare to be Ukraine supporters, um, they should be, well, uh, you should be very suspicious about that, unfortunately. You should also um, essentially uh, provide more attention of sorts and give more credibility to to the pe to the entities which are run by people from Ukraine, ideally, who are based in Ukraine and who are supported by Ukrainian civil society, who have some kind of a name in Ukraine. That's the ideal scenario, even though it's somewhat challenging. Otherwise, it's going to be essentially taking you, the agency of Ukrainians from Ukrainians, declaring the fake support of Ukraine, and just speaking for Ukrainians in the name of Ukrainians, uh, but doing very much questionable things at best. So this is where we are. So yeah, we have to be more proactive. We have to push back. We have to elevate Ukrainian civil society leaders uh, or just people who are genuine Ukraine supporters and uh, convey them uh, and transmit their notions and talking points and themselves to English speaking audiences. Otherwise, the thing that is imitation of support, uh, so-called Ukraine supporters will take the ground uh, we'll take out the oxygen and we'll imitate the thing and proceed with the nefarious actions. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, bringing us this very important angle because some, some, sometimes we are actually um, encouraging support for Ukraine and could not even notice that something is wrong in the very actually uh, actions and the very organizations which are trying to, to be helpful but sometimes can even do more harm. Thank you very much. And now I'm switching for Natalia Gumenyuk. Uh, so uh, Natalia uh, is and uh, forever, I don't know, used to be the uh, journalist covering um, so the war in Ukraine now for uh, different uh, international media. And also one more interesting thing in your biography is about traveling and covering uh, around African countries and Middle East. And actually one more angle we would like to hear uh, from is about the uh, work with, uh, which needs to be done uh, not only by the officials like MFA who declared we would like to go to Africa and uh, I don't know to explain more about Ukraine but probably even from our side of I don't know media bloggers content makers what are the narratives right now in the uh, designated areas I told you before and what are your probably tips what can be done more to uh, bring more Ukraine to the regions which have historically been less covered. Um, hi, uh, good to talk to you. There is a lot to share, but I'll start with a bit of some of the systematic uh, 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 approach on on the solutions as well. Um, so um, within one of the projects I co-run, which is the Reckoning Project, uh, I, my team in Ukraine uh, work on the documenting war crimes, we do that for the media uh, reports, but also for possible litigation. What's important in our team are also the journalists, international journalists who reported uh, the worst globally for many, many years, including our our lawyers and analysts who are of Syria in the region. So we're generally looking at the patterns and trying to look at this 
in the Russian invasion and the Russian war against uh, Ukraine, not just as a war against Ukraine, because there are a lot of similarities. And if you, we really speak about the Middle East and Syria in particular, it's even the very same people who were running some of the operation, uh, like uh, General Surovikin, who was, you know, in charge of bombing Aleppo and then, uh, you know, was destroying uh, the Mariupol and the Ukrainian south. So there is way uh, more, first of all, it's very important to say about the broader a broader view on the conflict and positioning it as uh, not just the unfortunate thing for the Ukrainians. But when we speak about the propaganda, as also somebody who was looking at the case for so many years for the for the way how the Russian propaganda was developing uh, from the occupation to Crimea for all these years and how it was uh, you know promoted during the all those years. Um, globally, beyond the uh, beyond Europe, I should say that we need to differenti differentiate two things. There is, of course, there are, of course, dif disinformation campaigns uh, with all the fake accounts, everything very, uh, you know, helpful. What just colleague, my colleagues uh, reflected. But we are now looking at something else as well, in particular the legal responsibility of the propagandists for incitement of violence, for incitement of, um, for, of the war crimes, crimes against humanity and possibly the attempt of genocide. Because even if you speak about the case of bombing Mariupol, um, you know, uh, you can say that before bombing the mater maternity, Word, the Russia was uh, doing a special campaign where find an excuses to bomb this war, uh, maternity word. When we were doing the, um, you know, reports, so for instance, when we were covering uh, the horrible case of when the whole village in, in Yahidne, in Chernihiv region has been in the basement, um, this story was recently by our team uh, published in, in the Time magazine, uh, you know, the, 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 the villages of this, uh, we, uh, the villages were also receiving Komsomolska Pravda, the most, the most popular uh, paper in, in, in Russia, a special edition, which actually was, was the reasoning for the Russian soldiers to commit these alleged crimes against humanity. So for us, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about this uh, with the reason. Uh, because I think that uh, wherever I also travel and try to interact with our uh, the foreign colleagues outside of Europe and the US, um, I find more and more that, for instance, such platform as RT, they could be a legit source of news in Kenya. They could be the, uh, the, the RTs, for instance, opening a huge bureau in South Africa with hundreds and hundreds of people to being um, to be hired, to be hired, and I think this time already to stop the discussion. You know where is the limits of the freedom of speech? Uh, you know, like these ideas about you know CNN, Fox News doing things wrong, RT is doing things wrong. We I, we got it in in Europe, we got it in the US uh, to a large extent, uh, but still uh, a lot of the resources by the Russians are um, really invested into promoting and and staying very strong. Um, outside of uh, Europe and, uh, and, and the US, in the southern hemisphere, in the global south. So really, uh, what would be the answer? Because, you know, disregarding all type of the campaigns, and I would list them further, uh, this, uh, these sources of information still there are present. So for us, the question would be, and the answer would be, you know, can we really pr prove that uh, this, uh, this um, media outlets, these venues, they are not just another venue. That, for instance, if there would be the legal responsibility of the propagandists of the people like Margarita Simonian calling for genocide, that that would be just a, beyond the bad taste. You know, it's it, there is a limit when people are doing wrong things and when they are in, indicted for the alleged war crimes, when they are possibly indicted for the, um, you know, even the attempt of genocide. But at least at this stage, let's speak about the war crimes and the um, at, and the uh, um, crimes against humanity. So that would be, uh, for me, the most helpful and important uh, direction, the venue, how we actually work systematically. If you really speak about the, uh, the countries and the narratives, um, I won't go to the details. Uh, there are sometimes sporadic campaigns. So, for instance, there was a very big sporadic campaign 
trying to portray Ukraine racist. It was very big in India, de facto, when uh, there was a news uh, when uh, highlighted um, and picked up out of everything uh, when uh, as if there were like real troubles for the Indian students to leave uh, the leave Ukraine uh, in the first days of the war when there was a huge, uh, you know, huge um, crowds on the border with Poland and as if the Ukrainian um, border guards treated them unfairly. It might be the case, uh, but we knew that, you know, this campaign was blown up out of the proportion. It was one of the major stories for, for India for, you know, days and days and weeks trying to portray the Ukrainians like racist and uh, the people who do not deserve the support Support and it was traveled well, you know, around. Um, while, um, again, like I said, like in our team, uh, which is mainly Ukrainian, but also international, we also see very often uh, that um, I mentioned international by having the Syrian colleagues on, uh, in, in, in our team. Uh, we see that uh, this idea that Ukrainians uh, are disproportionately supported and it's hypocritical, this is a hypocrisy of the West. That's also a very strong narrative saying that, like, you see why Ukrainians are actually not in the worse shape than we were in Africa, in, in the Middle East. But yes, the Ukrainian refugees, uh, because they are white, uh, they, they, they deserve more support from from Europe and the whole support is really, uh, you know, unfair and hypocritical. So with this, uh, Ukraine receives even, so with this also, why should we be on this side if, if Ukraine has, uh, if the West again and again um, really demonstrates its, its hypocrisy? Quite a usual uh, thing. Um, so that would be my my my, my kind of major. T of course, th th there is no secret, and I think it's quite general, uh, clear to understand that both in Africa and as in Latin America, what we know, the general nar narrative is to you know pos position this war as a war of two empires, of the Russian Empire against the uh, the American Empire. And when, for instance, I would speak to the people about the the trials, uh, the the usual question would be whether it would be in Uganda or elsewhere, uh, that, uh, you know, how about the uh, responsibility of the U.S. for the war in, um, in Iraq uh, and that kind of things. Um, so uh, for me, the most important... Um, uh, and that would so so it would be always not really trying to drag the conversation outside of Ukraine. Just recently, I was on the panel answering the questions from the group of the Central American journalists, you know, Salvador, um, Nicaragua, Guatemala. And what was interesting that we were there, a couple of Ukrainians uh, were aimed to answer the questions of the uh, of the international journalist about the war in Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine. But uh, during the one hour conversation, absolute majority of the questions, they were not about Ukraine. They were about the Russian support to Nicaragua, you know, the, you know, the, the, the Salvador, China, geopolitics, uh, America. So for, for me, the answer would be still that, is that the one of the critical answer for that, it's put Ukraine on the mental map uh, or, or of the people outside of uh, Europe and the US. Make it more feasible because the most trickiest discussion is where is the uh, is a discussion uh, where this war is seen again as a fight between the US and Russia. And that's a very weak point. And then for, for the Ukrainians in absolute mass is really to, to build the solidarity uh, on something else, build the solidarity on, uh, you know, on the ideas that if we, you know, if, if the Syrians didn't uh, get the justice in their war. Can we finally get in? That that or Iraqis that shouldn't be the reason why Ukrainians uh, shouldn't get it. And can be this solidarity based around the human rights. So for us, the most important is to create this uh, this this human connections. Uh, I think the answer would be nothing but, uh, you know, more more direct contacts, more cooperation, direct cooperation between the Ukrainians, South Asians, Africans, Latin Americans. Um, um, it, again, there would be always smaller campaigns. So, for instance, we knew that uh, I was curious to know that, for instance, I mightn't be mistaken, but I guess it was in... Um, 
I think most probably it was Senegal. I, I want to be, it was definitely in West Africa when there was an absolutely like super popular blogger, Twitter, Twitter persona, um, you know, a, a type of, uh, you know, uh, vaccine deniers who, who was absolutely popular with going on tweeting all the different things about Ukraine, all the Russian fakes. Uh, but when I was talking to the Senegalese journalists, they were really always explaining that, you know, um, often uh, the Russia plays with the, you know, other problems uh, they um, these countries have with France. So, for instance, if the, the Russian flag in, in Mali would mean nothing but, uh, you know, protest against France. So it's very complex. It should be very, very, um, any any approach should be very, very complex and um, well thought. It should be targeted. There is one thing in Argentina, another thing in Nicaragua, another thing in Kenya, in West Africa, South Africa, and totally different in Asia. So we should really explain these stories. But I think for Ukrainians, it's also very important not to, um, you know, demand support and solidarity. Uh, solidarity is not something you demand. It's is the is there or not? It's really about the human stories, about com common struggle. Uh, it would be very difficult for Ukrainians. It would be very um, harmful if Ukrainians would build their campaigns against telling, like, you don't understand, we are suffering. But you know how you can explain suffering to the uh, to the people in Ethiopia who now experience a horrible, you know, crisis as well. So it shouldn't be built from the position of the competition of the victim victimhood, as we sometimes see from some of the Ukrainians, uh, but uh, would be more smart. And uh, as long as, and as we um, just recently, I was given here interview in Kiev for the Argentinian journalist, you know, we always can find something in common. We always can be build upon uh, as long as there is this, this, this direct communication. But um, so I would end up with this, as I said, like there are a lot of like smaller things, smaller campaigns, which are constantly constantly uh, reappearing. Uh, but for me still, uh, for instance, the, the presence of the, as I, I'm returning back to my initial points, so for me the return, um, the, the, the most critical would be to really see how we work systematically with, uh, with such entities as RT uh, promotion and uh, build up in, in, in Southern Hemisphere. And still for us the most uh, important would be Mm, the responsibility of the pro propagandists in the real trials, indictment for them, because then the countries which are neutral, then the countries which maybe, you know, like they ha they were busy with their own things, uh, then uh, they might understand, you know, like if, if this media outlet is indicted, uh, by something, uh, maybe really better stay away. You know, there, it, it, it's something beyond just this opposition, you know, comparison of the poor, uh, you know, Fox News with RT. Uh, so that would be my, 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 my end goal if we really speak about uh, how we deal with a, with a, with a Russian information campaign uh, in, in, in other parts of the world. Thank you very much, Natalia. I highly appreciate, actually, that you combined uh, the uh, not only the problem, but the problem-solving part. Thanks a lot. And we're switching to Agnieszka. I would like to ask you um, the very, uh, like, it, it is a simple and not simple question. So you're studying um, foreign policy for quite a, quite, quite a long period of time, especially, like, in this our area. I, I will, I'm not going to uh, name it as opposed to something, no. Uh, but, like, Ukraine and, of course, Russia. And um, my question will be interconnected. So is it possible, upon your all experience you've seen, to battle uh, Russian propaganda or disinformation campaigns, whatever you name it, uh, which uh, have been used in different situations uh, and in different wars uh, in Moldova, in Georgia, in Ukraine now? Uh, could it be battled with truth or we need to do anything else? No, it's okay. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we must. Um, you know, because when we are, you know, for a long, for a last year, we've been doing this. We've been doing this, not only uh, think tank experts, not only uh, journalists, but also, let's say, such experts 
and scientists li like me, politologists, dealing with Russian foreign policy for a long time. And what we uh, are doing, uh, not, only, uh, not only since the 24th of February, is mm, uh, meeting our colleagues in Western Europe and uh, trying to convince them uh, that um, uh, Russia is not only a country of ballet, Tchaikovsky and, um, you know, oh yes, yes, on the, and Dostoevsky, uh, and what we are really stressing and we are trying to push an idea, not only promote, but convince them that this is the last moment, this is that time when we should make up with our failures and mistakes uh, committed several years and decades uh, ago. It's time to call Russia by proper names. Uh, it's time to look at Russia not from a perspective of very romantic literature, so we have to de-romantize Ru Russia. Uh, we, tr we, we have to call Russia not a sovereign democracy or Putinist country. We have to uh, understand, uh, finally understand, uh, that Russia is a new, new totalitarian uh, state, not only a Russian country, because as I, I was trying even to promote more the term of Russia as a Russian country and Putinism like a, a Russian version of fascism, but uh, I don't want to say that I failed, that I have failed, but uh, I know that the term uh, that Russia is a Russian country is not so easy to be promoted because all the time I am, you know, I am, uh, the response is that come on, Fascism was only was a very unique um, political system. So, uh, just digging the topic, we understand, and we even uh, created um, uh, a special uh, group of Polish um, experts on Russia. Uh, uh, you know, with aim to promote and just to to convince our uh, Western European colleagues to uh, create a campaign, international campaign, uh, within think tanks, within experts, within journalists and universities, just to finally start uh, talking about Russia with proper words. Uh, as I told you, Russia is a new, uh, new t totalitarian country. Russia is a, uh, a racist country. Uh, what's more, and uh, Russia is a revisionist country because we have to understand that the threat of of Russia is much more serious than we used to think. Because what Russia is doing w w in in Ukraine is not only a trial to destroy uh, the country which, which was not um, ready to join uh, Ruski Emir. Uh, what Russia has been doing is um, trying to destroy international order. And this is fundamental for us because once we agree Russia to win by compromise uh, at the negotiation table, we will have in several years time, Russia much more aggressive, much more ready to use more force, more, more uh, let's say, aggression. So this is the, the last moment we uh, sh not only should, but we must um, uh, talk about Russia and convince our Western, and as Natalia, I was impressed also with the recent uh, uh, Natalia uh, input, we have to convince, not us, we have to convince our colleagues in Middle East, in Africa, uh, and Asia, because uh, it's enough just to look at the map, and we will learn that two-thirds of population Two thirds, let's, let's say, that that people uh, being neutral or just supporting Russia or being very uh, justifying Russia, they live. Uh, two thirds of the global population is is living in such countries. So, and I understand, and I follow how uh, uh, Mr. Wavrov has been, you know, pilgriming. Uh, mm -hmm. is doing his pilgrimages uh, to 
um, Africa, Middle East, uh, and Asia just to fight for hearts and minds of their societies. So we as Poland, as Ukraine, as, as European countries, as, as, as US, as the West, we should, uh, let's say, uh, trial, try more to convince our Middle Eastern and African colleagues that that they are just uh, they are mistaken believing that Russia is that, that Russia was never a colonial power. Russia was a colonial power, and Russia was colonizing not only non-Russian nations, but Russia was also colonizing itself. Uh, and this is nothing new. This is not rocket science. So that's why we we and now I'm I'm just uh, making this story short. Uh, what we have to do is to um, uh, how to say is to not only debunk Russian uh, disinformation, but be more proactive. We have to explain, we have to fight for truth, and we have to correct our, let's say, very romantic uh, expertise on Russia. And one more very quick question to you. Uh, could we probably, uh, how, how it is possible, and what should we do to overcome the historical thing uh, dealing with Africa and Latin America, especially with Africa? So we all know that uh, Russia put both money and information uh, sustainably there. And uh, if Ukraine is just starting its path, actually, and we are trying to contact the countries we've never contacted before. But what should, sh what should we do with historical part? And probably Mateusz would like to add up, up something. I'm, I see this, yeah. Yeah, of course, uh, this is what we have mentioned several months ago, just at the beginning of invasion, that we have to speed up and hurry up and just be more focused on Middle East and Africa. And our diplomacies, our embassies, all of them, all of the Western embassies should be more active there and should start a campaign of informing uh, societies, more, uh, doing more conferences on not only uh, Russian uh, colonialism, but informing them that Russia was as colonial as uh, Great Britain, as France, and Russia cannot be uh, perceived as the very unique country being uh, uh, leading some time ago an anti-colonialism movement, uh, because this is Russian lie, and that's why we have to be more proactive. For me, it's enough to start um, uh, let's say more, less, uh, let's say informative uh, campaigns, more uh, the think tanks meetings, just to uh, open uh, this window of opportunity to convince them that Russia is not so unique and Russia was and is a colonial uh, colonial country and very aggressive also vis-a-vis -vis them because at the end of the day once you have Wagner group in your country then you will have Donbass maybe uh, in some time yeah mm -hmm. and Mateusz so of course yeah. yeah I'm I'm ready also to add something because when I uh, heard the, the, the input the my historical uh, mind are, are awakened and uh, this is the not new issue yeah. The, the the Africa Latin America is is the is the part of the world which is out of uh, American perspective maybe wider out of European Atlantic perspective so this is the this is the thing which is uh, which is uh, um, lived by the years and uh, we we cannot uh, uh, take an effort like uh, little countries like uh, Ukrainians, like uh, the me medium countries maybe, like Ukrainian, like Poles itself, we must uh, choose a wise and, and ambassadors in that part of the world. Uh, so in the fact, uh, uh, there is no uh, coincidence that they are uh, picking up uh, the points of pressure from that part of the world, like, uh, like it was described, uh, two-thirds of part of the world uh, are in these nations. So there was no mistake to uh, uh, th that under hashtag Africans in Ukraine at the beginning of the war, like I described, uh, the, the most vocal group was from Africa, of, of course, but also from India. 
so th this is the this is the goals which we see that the uh, the embassies uh, um, of, of uh, embassies of, of Russia at these countries in 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 Africa in Latin America uh, are active also in spreading this information in English language. But we uh, we we skip the 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 thing which is crucial f from for for that time. Uh, the the Arabic countries different alphabet. We are not controlling the the infosphere in that that way because. It's out of our uh, our uh, top of to, it's out of our minds for now. We are focusing about the the situation which is near of us, but but the, uh, the, the that situation is also uh, linked to the to the current uh, thing. And, and and one thing more which I want to underline: this is a battle of values, and we must understand that the 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 other part, the other uh, side want to exploit our abusing our our values to to um, be encounter them in our minds so they are the disinformation is the perfect example of this uh, of the the limits which we are uh, which we are in we are in the box of these values we we care about them but they they don't uh, the, the other side uh, don't care about this they they exploit it and we must understand to being proactive also to uh, bring the simple wording to describe the situation uh, at the Africa, at the Latin America, at the India, which is crucial for us, for the cause. Thank you very much, Mateusz. And uh, we have another 10 like, minutes to, to finish our uh, first panel. And of course, now we need to uh, hear from Elspeth and Oleg about the two large organizations which are dealing with this information. So the Open Information Partnership, Elspeth Southers is leading the team in, uh, doing a huge job and in terms of disinformation in Ukraine. Could you please give us uh, actually an idea what uh, the organization is doing and probably so several insights you've seen uh, from your researchers because you're doing great in this field. The floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, let's see. Oh dear, this is not going to let me share our screen, is it? Um, boop, 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 boop. Probably we need any help. No, it's, oh dear. Um, it's going to, it's trying to make me update my settings. And if I try to do that, it's going to quit. I knew I should have tested this before. And sorry, everyone, I'm afraid you are going to be stuck with my giant floating head instead of my PowerPoint. Um, so briefly to discuss the Open Information Partnership, um, it is a network of organizations across 25 countries in Europe, all of which are working to promote some flavor of information integrity and access to good information in their local country and regionally. Um, the project provides financial and other support to all of these organizations. And one of the largest initiatives that we undertook last year uh, between May and October was the so-called Ukraine War Disinformation Monitoring Group. Um, and this was a project run by organizations in 14 countries, 13 groups. Um, and they used a standard methodology to monitor Kremlin disinformation narratives as promulgated by Kremlin aligned news sources, right? So this was not a project looking at the media writ large or social media writ large. This was looking at news and online sources of specifically Kremlin disinformation. Um, it used a coherent methodology whereby all of the groups used a series of online tools to search for a standard set of terms each week um, and then returned the leading disinformation narratives per country. And so what this was able to do, because we were monitoring across geography and time, was to see which narratives would sort of pop up in one country and then swing to another, which narratives would pop up and then wither and not take effect. So we were actually able to sort of see how the Kremlin was strategizing in terms of sharing some of these narratives. Um, and one of those interesting things that we saw uh, is that, as much as anything else, the narratives that were the key narratives were precisely the ones anybody would have predicted prior to the war. They were anti-Western narratives, narratives discrediting Ukraine, narratives aggrandizing Russian military power, anti-sanctions narratives, which includes narratives about energy security, and then toxic pacifism narratives, right? Narratives saying Ukraine needs to end this war now to, to reduce human suffering. 
Um, the one narrative that actually did not show up in most contexts um, that you would have thought would be on that list and that we had thought would be on that list was narratives about ethnic Russians or Russian speakers outside of Russia being persecuted. That is something you saw show up quite a lot in the first few weeks of the war, but it never took hold. It never actually made the jump to sort of mainstream media, and therefore it was actually abandoned by the Kremlin. Um, some of the other things that you see, saw, and it's unfortunate that I don't have my graph here to show you, um, is that these narratives were very different per country. They were tailored to the local environment and to local anxieties and concerns, again, very much as you would expect. Um, and one of the sort of standout examples of this is in Georgia, um, where narratives saying that NGOs, the political opposition guided by the West, are trying to open a second front in Georgia, trying to drag Georgia into the war. And you saw this narrative showing up in something like a quarter of disinformation content, which is about twice as often as it showed up in any other context. Um, and unfortunately, this is a narrative that, as I think many of you know, did ultimately make the jump to being mainstream in Georgia. Um, one of the other narratives that we saw, as was already discussed by my colleague from Poland, um, was about historic grievances against in particular refugees, um, and it was about stopping the Ukrainization of Poland, right? Stop these Ukrainians from coming in and taking over parts of our country. Um, however, um, you do also see that the, the anti-refugee narrative, at least in its initial stages, so sort of looking June through October, um, failed to take hold. Um, and if you actually plot it out over time, you can see that there were a decreasing number of appeals to that particular narrative showing up because it didn't seem to be working. Um, in terms of sort of broad lessons learned from this project, um, we are able to establish that right pro Kremlin disinformation is adaptable. It can adapt to different contexts, different countries, different priorities, but it remains a blunt instrument, and it really struggled to adapt to, in particular, failures on the battlefield. Every time there was a major failure, you would see very inconsistent, incoherent narratives coming through on the channels, and they weren't able to sort of quickly coalesce to an explanation of why Russia had suffered a setback. Um, we also see the importance of strategic communications and countermeasures in the countries where the governments were very proactive in communicating positive lines about Ukraine, positive lines about Ukrainians. You saw many, many fewer narratives taking hold. Um, in a similar vein, it's absolutely important to identify the communities that are most vulnerable. If you compare, for example, the disinformation that was targeting Russian speakers in the Baltics versus speakers of the three Baltic languages, it was a much, much higher volume of disinformation and it spread much more rapidly and much further. Um, you also see that that it is, to a certain degree, um, possible to forecast Kremlin disinformation by looking at recent patterns. If you see a little uptick in how effective narratives are becoming, you can, in fact, almost universally conclude that you will see an explosion in narratives on that subject. Um, and also, as we've discussed extensively on this panel, and I'm glad that it has come up, um, the application of these lessons should not be limited to Europe. Right? We have seen a pivot away from Northern and Western Europe by the Kremlin um, to Latin America, to South to Africa, to East Asia, and not only, um, even just seeing right the pivot to the Balkans, for example, in Southern Europe. Um, so this is a real concern. Um, looking forward, um, we are actually in the process of launching phase two of this project, um, which will have a slightly expanded and revised ge geography, and we'll actually be focusing primarily on Telegram. We're going to be working with an external supplier who's going to be helping us monitor disinformation on Telegram channels. Um, and the countries we're going to be including in this, I will read you the whole list just in case anyone is curious, are Armenia, Belarus, Bulgaria, Estonia, Georgia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, Poland, Slovakia, and Ukraine. Um, in Hungary, Georgia, and Slovakia, there's not quite enough Telegram usage, so we'll be monitoring Facebook sources there instead. Um, and we hope to actually from this, partly because we are using an external data supplier, um, come up with a more consistent and comparable set of results across countries to enable us to do a little bit more quantitative analysis, quantitative, yes, quantitative analysis than we've been able to do previously. Um, and also, as I think many of you know, right, Telegram is the source of some of the most pernicious Russian narratives, um, the sorts of things that 
thankfully don't normally see the light of day in other sorts of channels. Um, in terms of lessons learned about what to do about this, right, and this is lessons drawn sort of more broadly from, from OIP, um, there are a number of approaches you can take. And as other people have said, this depends very heavily, of course, on the context. Um, so, for example, in environments where there are good existing legal frameworks, um, it is actually possible to, for example, demonetize disinformation challenges. We've seen this be successful in the Czech Republic and in Lithuania, um, where you've been able to actually successfully work with Google and with the government to get Google ads removed from some of the main disinformation portals, dramatically impacting their revenue. Um, in other contexts, right, as we've discussed, there can be legal avenues, whether it's persecuting people for, for hate speech or other sorts of speech crimes, but also you can investigate, right, who is behind disinformation outlets. And oftentimes those people are under sanctions or complicit in other forms of corruption and financial crime, right? These, these channels are often funded by, by black money to the extent you can trace that those funds, they are often shared through illegal means, right? So you can actually impose other sorts of costs on these actors. Um, and finally, in certain circumstances, especially when you have sort of larger narratives that have taken on a, a degree of importance, right? This sort of thing is not worth doing for minor narratives that are transient. Um, you can actually work on sort of broader social campaigns to, as one of my colleagues likes to say, make these narratives stink, right? Many of these narratives, they are calling Ukrainians Nazis, denying that the human rights abuses have taken place, all of these things. These narratives stink. They are awful. People who say them should get the same reaction as people who deny the Holocaust, um, right? So it's about making sure that people understand that that is the level of badness of these, right? And that you don't get the reaction of like, oh, well, you know, it's sort of like Fox News also lies because it isn't, um, as we've said. Um, I think that's about my list. So thank you very much you very and much, just happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Elspeth. Actually, we are waiting for the second phase of your uh, researches and we are very curious what will be the results. So uh, looking forward to this and thank you for your doing. Please let us know if you want to be on the mailing list and if any of the participants want to share addresses, we'd be happy to include you. Perfect. Thank you very much. And now we're like we are having a, a, an hour a participant and an hour five last minutes to talk about. Unfortunately, we are always run of time. And you are representing the Alinea International. And uh, as far as I know, so the organization was helping the cabinet of ministers of Ukraine before the war with the strategic communications. Uh, are you doing anything uh, alike right now dealing with? Uh, uh, Ukrainian power, uh, Ukrainian authorities, or what is your focus actually in dealing in dealing with disinformation and stuff in Ukraine? Uh, first of all, uh, Alinea International carries on of working with the government of Ukraine, mainly providing technical assistance to the government. So that's uh, you know for the last year that was. Uh, primarily assistance to the government to sustain the war effort, to advance the reforms, and to prepare the grounds for the recovery, both wartime and post-war recovery. And communications has been part of this process to uh, A, prevent uh, Russian propaganda narratives that may undermine those efforts of the government of Ukraine. And the second one is to avoid uh, social friction between the Ukrainian public and the government by more transparent and balanced communication of what the government is about to do in this very uh, volatile time. However, when we talk about Russian disinformation, I would probably focus on a bit of a different initiative that I'm part of uh, together with the another person in our room, Olga Yurkova, uh, where we work together on actually something similar to what Zinc is about to do, which is the uh, telegram monitoring and analysis of the Russian disinformation uh, aimed at different types of audiences. So probably uh, a lot of the uh, previous speakers focused on the narratives. I will uh, just sort of add up more on types of audiences that we are looking into. And uh, the narratives are being really uh, uh, sort of targeting different types of these audiences. So number one is obviously the Russian public itself and how Russian disinformation attempts to maintain the high level of support for the war effort, but also explain why Russian war against Ukraine is justified by in the eyes of the Kremlin. The second one is the Ukrainian public and efforts to undermine the Ukrainian uh, support of their government, of their military, and of the overall resistance to the Russian aggression. 
And then the other two is one is support of the West to Ukraine and the uh, attitudes of the global South, so to speak. So this is what uh, Natalia and uh, uh, other members of the panel uh, mentioned uh, while talking about African countries, Latin America, South Asia, and so forth. So really, when we were looking at the uh, disinformation narratives that uh, Russia employs, it's really heavily dependent on the type of audiences they are targeting, on their understanding what makes them click. So what are some of the triggers? What are some of the specific messages that resonate with these audiences? One of the best examples is something that emerged much more uh, prominently throughout the last year is the message that Russia wages a war of decolonization uh, or the war against the imperialist West. This is something that uh, appeared much less before. But now uh, it's one of those uh, major messages that is being broadcasted to the countries that may not really care about you know, this uh, sort of denazification rhetoric that the Kremlin employs for the Western audiences or whatever economic arguments that uh, may be resonant to the West. But by uh, eluding and sort of triggering the sentiments and notions of the African uh, and, uh, and other uh, parts of the world, uh, sort of sentiments towards the uh, uh, colonial past. And for us, this is uh, very important to, uh, as part of this project, to inform, in our case, the Center for uh, Disinformation under the Ministry of Culture and Information Policy, in order to collect, classify, and analyze these disinformation narratives in order to create more uh, effective countermeasures whether it's communication campaigns or efforts to uh, inform the journalists and the media to inform of this in the kind of more uh, kind of, uh, resonant way as well. Actually, we're going to hear from a person from this Center for Disinformation uh, uh, under the uh, Ministry of Culture in the second. I mean, it, it will be the second online panel, but the third we're having today. Uh, sorry for taking too much time for this first panel we're having, but I'm sure that it would uh, like be beneficial and it was very interesting. Uh, thank you for bearing with us. We have 10 minutes break and afterwards we will resume with the Ukrainian experts on disinformation. And we will find more answers what to be done actually in the info space to uh, counteract Russian propaganda and be su successful in maintaining the sustainable support for Ukraine. Thank you.
Okay, dear colleagues, we... Дорогі колеги, переходимо до третьої частини нашого панелу. Переходимо. Have the Ukrainian part right now and please uh, so the guys and girls who are watching us online please switch the sound if you would like to hear us in English. Отже, дорогі колеги, я дуже рада говорити I'm really happy to speak Ukrainian. Thank you very much. I would like to welcome uh, uh, welcome my uh, colleagues Alona Romanyuk. Uh, she's an independent disinformation expert, uh, author of uh, anti-fake games called uh, Nota Yenota. It's a very interesting um, story. We'll learn about it, why the name. Uh, next, Olga Yurkova, co-founder um, Stop Fake Initiative, um, and Marina uh, Dorosh, a media literacy expert, leader of uh, Learn to Design project. Uh, she's a, um, also a great part of our team. Uh, we'll be joined online by our colleagues Solomia Borsos, Executive Director of the Ukrainian Institute. Uh, she's uh, representing uh, the cultural sphere in Ukraine. I hope uh, we will be joined by Irina Subota expert at Center for Strategic Communications and Information Security. I'm very happy to see you. Uh, we'll start with research uh, to look at the numbers and to think what, what to do uh, with them. Uh, I'd like to walk, um, give the floor to uh, Solomia Borsos. What kind of um, examples we could focus on? Solomia has a lot to say. Uh, so um, I'm sure we won't fit in all the stories you have, but Salomia, uh, the floor is yours. And afterwards we will have um, a very good conversation on your experience within the past year of, um, uh, of Ukraine, um, of the war in Ukraine. Welcome everybody. Uh, hello Yulia, I'm really happy to be with you at least online. Um, I attended uh, the previous part of the panel online and I was very happy because uh, to, to join you because um, I would like to uh, show you my presentation, not to repeat any notions here. Uh, but I hope, um, um, I, I think that some of the um, insights on my side are very similar to, to yours. I think the um, all the people in 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 the room is typically are, are typically Ukrainian, so I will I'll try to keep you interested so you don't look at the phones. Um, I would like to welcome you, uh, all participants, to ask questions, uh, wave your hands, to um, support what I'm saying or or not. Um, I will be sharing a presentation. I think uh, it will help you understand what I'm uh, talking about. And I will be happy to listen to your feedback. Now I just need to find uh, the button to share my presentation. Okay, can you see it? Yes. Great. Uh, speaking about the Ukrainian Institute, I will... You will please, uh, I'd like to have a sh show of hands, uh, which one of you knows about uh, or heard about uh, the Ukrainian Institute? Uh, I would say like 40% of the attendees know about this. Um, our our institute is means we are a state um, organization. Uh, 
uh, we were established in 2017, uh, but really started in 2018. We uh, work within the uh, foreign ministry um, department. Um, our colleagues and curators uh, are really employed in the institute. We uh, we are not an um, an institution uh, receiving commissions from uh, from the ministry. We enjoy more freedom in that respect. Um, However, the advisory board uh, is made of in three fourths of international experts. Uh, we enjoy a lot of freedom in uh, our activity. I must say that we really do enjoy this. This is why I'm really happy to share the information on our institution. Uh, our partners are um, Goethe Institute, the Polish Institute, Swedish Institute, among others. Uh, there is a small budget that we share, but uh, still we, we enjoy it very much. Uh, this slide shows the structure of the um, institute. I'm the um, general direct, um, director. Vorodymyr Sheiko is the um, deputy director. I'm responsible for the operation of um, operation activities of our institute. Uh, we, um, within my responsibilities, is opening um, offices of our institute outside of Ukraine. Uh, how do we differ as an institution, for example, from organization uh, other similar ins institutions dealing with Ukrainian culture. We work with cultural diplomacy and cultural um, interconnections. Culture is the stuff of our activity. Culture is also the goal of our activity. Uh, when we speak about uh, political uh, issues, culture is the medium to speak about it. Uh, we also cooperate with universities, um, and there is a lot of research that we uh, perform in that respect. And also art. Uh, we differentiate nine different parts uh, of our activity. Uh, so you can see information campaigns, literature, uh, cinema, theater, music, uh, cross-sector, visual um, arts, uh, and, and other spheres. <laughs> Maybe you've seen some of our information campaigns in Ukraine. Uh, for example, comparative photos, how uh, buildings were destroyed during the war and how they were rebuilt. Uh, we published uh, in total 400 uh, pictures. This campaign will continue um, in the future as well. Uh, our key geography, you can see in the slide, our priority countries is um, as, as, as a team of 46 uh, people we understand we can't really encompass the whole world but um, we strategize in terms of uh, the countries we cooperate uh, with and of course we were forced to um, identify a focus um, a key partner company um, country This is why we are aligned in Ukraine in terms of diplomacy. Maybe you could say that our alignment is North Atlantic um, sphere. Uh, we're talking about a lot of uh, companies of Global South. Um, just to keep it short, I will be using it as well. Uh, what are the insights from the past year uh, that Yulia asked me to share with you and what we'll be working uh, on in the next years? Uh, our key geography uh, will not change. Uh, the 
Euro-Atlantic uh, focus will be retained. Uh, but yesterday, as we've heard, we are getting prepared to uh, the long-term perspective of the war. Uh, uh, but the year 2002 has clearly shown, as we have already discussed here, that other countries like Latin America, Mexico, Brazil, Ar uh, Brazil Argentina, um, Asia, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, and in Africa, um, South Africa, Kenya, and Rwanda. These the the, the countries that uh, remained in focus previously and will remain so. For India, I think it. It's really peculiar because usually they do not support us uh, also in the economic um, decisions. Uh, this is why we need to cooperate with these countries. This is one of our uh, key answers for uh, 2022, um, agreed upon with uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. and in in Ukraine, we don't have a lot of experts from these um, countries. Within the upcoming months, we will be looking for people who want to devote their years of, of practice and possibly even life to uh, working with these companies. We will be uh, building upon expertise and we'll be contacting uh, cultural um, diplomats. Uh, within um, informational campaigns, for example, or other spheres of art. I will get back to um, the countries I mentioned before. Uh, one of the biggest insights, it's not about the Ukrainian Institute, but on my side, a personal one, Uh, I call it um, a leg in the door strategy. It's uh, the it's about the presence of Ukrainian diplomacy in Europe. We're not we're not trying just to be there, um, just to go and visit uh, Europe, but be there for for a longer time. We're planning to uh, establish offices. Uh, outside Ukraine, we are preparing funds for it and we'll be working on it, uh, especially when Ukraine receives more funds, but we're looking for funds and we found this uh, these funds as well uh, to be more present outside of Ukraine. Um, for example, in France, uh, and we have established some um, beginnings of the office uh, in, in France as well, and also in Berlin. Uh, on 29th uh, of March, if you're in Berlin, you can uh, you can join me to um, to open the Berlin office of the Ukrainian Institute. For us, this event, a performative event, uh, will mark the uh, the opening of uh, of this office uh, another project uh, we spoke about is decolonization uh, we started it in uh, April 2022 we're speaking about uh, the about decolonization, many um, participants were speaking and reading about decolonization, uh, researchers as well. But it's not about the decolonization of Ukraine. We are post-Soviet. Uh, we have other problems. Let's talk about 
We're speaking about the decolonization of Ukraine and Russian and the system of, uh, of knowledge to understand that Ukraine was for a very long time understood as a colony of Russia. We discuss this in terms of culture. It is indeed quite a geopolitical discussion. Um, but it's also uh, a matter of cultural dip diplomacy. Why is it important? According to researchers and writers, the way we represent Ukrainian art outside Ukraine, the way it is described in the museums of the world, you've probably seen it. Um, Malevich, Ivazovsky, I'm ready to uh, discuss it with you. About Ivazovsky, uh, 100 years ago, nobody would speak um, in terms of being Ukrainian. This is why we're not dealing only with um, di discussing a colonial past of Ukraine, but we also are engaged in discussing how much um, researchers in the West uh, is ready to discuss the, post the, the colonial past of Ukraine and not accept the the idea how the post-Soviet um, sphere was influential in Ukraine and how they ended up with their influences in, in Ukraine. Of 2022 and early 2023, we can say that uh, there was uh, at least a few uh, uh, publicistic academic articles in New Yorker. Maybe you heard about that. There was this uh, reflection of some uh, Western scientists who came to uh, Tbilisi, and she like uh, her eyes. Uh, she got her eyes wide open, and so she told us all the story. Uh, we're gonna uh, keep doing our job, and I'm encouraging you to get involved. Uh, we know why this happened. It was the uh, Russia's or Soviet Union's uh, part in that as well. But now we say like we're for Ukraine, we're for social equality, etc. But uh, this all um, resulted in the fact that we don't see Russia as empire now. We also uh, now we're trying to investigate this uh, matter of what empires are. Many countries uh, think, and many Ukrainians in Ukraine, uh, including some academicians, think that uh, no, we don't have it. We're not the colony. Uh, so you are wrong. We don't have this uh, typical experience, Western experience of being a colony. And this is the truth. And we say, OK, but now let's talk about what the typical uh, typical empire and typical colony are. And uh, it's not like we're the overseas colony. We uh, do not claim being the overseas colony. We're not. Uh, and we don't claim uh, being an uh, exception based on the color, skin, or something else. No, our colonial uh, past is the language, the culture. This is the strategy. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it was partially based on the, uh, on the ethos. Uh, but we Ukrainians, we were involved in development of the Soviet Union, yes, but we also participated in the uh, government uh, in ruling the Soviet Union, but not because of being Ukrainian, but because of forgetting that we were Ukrainians. And so there are a lot of such arguments they, that seem like uh, not evident. Uh, but I would like uh, also to stay upon the internal discussion, social discussion about being a colony. Uh, 
and I really encourage you to read these uh, two books. Can uh, can anyone has any comments on these? Yaroslav Kritsak uh, stands for the fact that we are not the colony, and he was the part of that uh, that part of the academic uh, society that says I think differently we're not the colony and the part of other philosophers uh, say uh, well Mr. Grisak here are the arguments to the opposites and um, you must have heard about this uh, huge discussion on Twitter on, on the internet but uh, I uh, insist that the fact of existence of such a discussion is already important. Um, also, there is uh, another point of view. Well, it's good that we have this discussion. It will help us realize uh, what we've been through and why uh, this or that happened to us. Another point is what we're going to understand as a person working here and as the institution in general, we need to, to talk about the past of Ukraine, about the history, explain uh, Timothy Snyder and other uh, Vera Geva and Yaroslav Grisak. Uh, they, uh, well, God bless them because we need their work. Uh, their work needs to be translated and we should uh, pay attention to that, to translate in their manuscripts. But I think uh, we should translate more and write more about Ukrainian history. Uh, so the present war and victory, uh, it should also be a subject of uh, scripts, of movies, of books. Uh, the future, uh, it's the well individual mind uh, insight from the past uh, year. We should not only uh, well, we should speak for the next 70 years. We have to talk and write all the way along and to be as successful as the State of Israel. Right now, we, are, uh, we have just started this huge path and, uh, of course, it uh, increases our lifetime. Another point is the formula which may be useful to you. We should become understandable to the world and to be uh, fellows to the Europe. Uh, what I mean by that is that we're known before 2022, not every country knew us. I have a friend from Indonesia who said that it's not correct. Like we know uh, British people for being tall and uh, German people for being punctual and the rest are Russian. And you see there are many uh, countries and people who had the same uh, perception and uh, there's a lot of work be before us. So we are known, but we have to become understandable so that people realize that our experience is different. We don't have the experience of uh, skin bias. Yeah, but we have uh, some other histories that we have to share. As for Europe, it's a bit different. We have to become uh, friends there, to become known there for, well, like, you know, uh, now in this century, many colleagues uh, in Europe say that, uh, explain how this war is uh, not only Ukrainian, and now everyone realizes that this is the war of Russia against Europe, against the free world, and there's been uh, the polls and surveys in Ukrainian mass media which confirm that that about 60 to 70 percent agree with this war being not only against Ukraine. But for us not to waste time on that for the coming years uh, during the war and post-war, we should become, you know, familiar to, uh, to Europe, to the world because those processes will help us uh, 
in terms of uh, the culture, of mentality, of our histories. So it's like we should come back home. I'm sorry for, uh, for being that long, but I'll be coming to an end. As for what Yulia said, I'm not going to describe a lot of uh, the, that presentation because at first I wouldn't like uh, to talk much about evil, but I have to tell that uh, we have a lot of uh, studies. We have eight studies of how Ukraine is, was perceived in Ukraine before 2022. Uh, uh, and this study seems a bit outdated, but it can be useful to us in terms of knowing what problems we had and what problems we have now and what we should do further. Also, at our website, we have this uh, study. I'd also like to highlight our study about how Russia has colonized and made their culture a weapon. We started that uh, study in March uh, when it was just the beginning of the uh, invasion and we we started different three different studies. It's very interesting about uh, the fund of uh, Gorchakov, the fund of Russian world, and another foundation. Just so an interesting fact that Gorchakov was the first uh, foreign minister of Russia working in uh, Crimea, and so that's what is behind the name of this fund. So even if the in the names of their funds, they manifest their attitude. And so in that study, you can find the genealogy of the word of Russian peace, Russian world. Maybe some of you were even born before that idea was born. This is the new concept. It's not based on anything, like a lot of things in Russian empire. So like a lot of things appeared from out from nothing. Uh, so there is no the concept of positivity. Uh, they have this uh, spirituality uh, in Russia, and it's unknown what it came from and how it got built. Uh, it was a really interesting study. I encourage you to read that. And uh, just as a hint, how it works, what forms it uses, so different clubs, NGOs in different countries or places. Uh, those who just read Dostoevsky, who is so uh, allegedly good and interesting. So it will be interesting for you how it was in the, what form it had. Unfortunately, we have uh, to stop now. I'm sorry for the delay, but I really encourage you to read. And here is, uh, well, my slides are based on those uh, reference materials, so you're really welcome to read them. Thank you, Salamia. We'll continue with our another speaker, Irina Subota. It's also interesting because uh, she's highlighting another aspect of the government policy about communication. She's an expert of the informational security and uh, co strategic communication. And uh, so I'd like to ask Irina, so you as the, like your institution uh, was established a year before the, uh, the war. So let's talk about the five basic insights uh, that you had uh, in course of at first planning the strategic communication and then implementing it in the government communication channels. And now you have to do that proactively on the 24-7 basis to fight uh, the uh, disinformation about Ukraine as uh, the country. Hello, everyone. I will also share my screen to tell you about our experience. So 
So I will tell you about the uh, build-up of the informational security of Ukraine based on our uh, center's work. So I'll be brief about our objectives, tasks, and the mission. So our center was established as the government organization working under the cultural ministry. Uh, it was created in 2021 as one of the mechanisms of building the national resilience, uh, fighting informational uh, threats and disinformation uh, along with government uh, bodies, NGOs and uh, international partners. We work uh, in a lot of uh, spheres. I'll focus on uh, fighting uh, Russian propaganda. Uh, and it's mostly monitoring and analysis of informational space. We track, monitor this uh, discourse, uh, revealing the informational threats that we can communicate as some pre-banking of uh, the of disinformation, as some preventive actions, and uh, fighting those uh, Kremlin narratives that are spread along the Ukrainian and uh, international uh, audience. As for the monitoring, we also use uh, uh, not only the uh, search, uh, direct search uh, through Telegram channels, but also the uh, machine uh, algorithm. Uh, another direction of our work is uh, conducting informational campaigns that work either as the preventive action when we tell uh, the true information about Ukraine, about the course of the war of Russia against Ukraine, and also uh, conduction of informational campaign uh, can be used when we talk about uh, like debunking some narratives or some campaigns which are global. Then we also use different channels of communication, different campaigns. Uh, let me share a few uh, examples uh, during this uh, large uh, invasion. Uh, how Ukrainian, uh, how Russian propaganda works, their instrument, um, also the uh, how to counteract this information. We're working, uh, we're making workshops. The aud um, auditorium is very diverse. Um, we work with um, state officials to talk more about hybrid threats on the side of, um, of Russia and how to counteract them and how we use it. Um, and, and we also uh, educate students and uh, uh, teachers how to recognize Russian propaganda and hybrid um, actions and how to not give up in the information sphere. Um, we uh, also work on proactive narratives, uh, on strategic communications. Uh, we can communicate with um, government of organizations and also uh, the key targets of Russian um, aggression. I will show you a few examples uh, with specific case studies um, which were uh, identified after the full-scale invasion of Russia on Ukraine. Uh, these examples uh, were prepared by Russia's uh, propaganda machine. Uh, there was the action with, uh, with a red flag. Um, many methods were um, introduced. Uh, they created an image which later they uh, used for a long time in the propaganda uh, action. Um, on the internet, <coughs> uh, there was a video um, published that uh, presenting uh, ostensibly a Ukrainian woman with a red uh, flag. Um, but that was a woman uh, who did not want uh, Russian aggr aggressors to uh, stamp on Ukrainian um, soil. Uh, then they turned out these people uh, to be Ukrainian. And they did not uh, really hurt the woman but gave her uh, food products. The Russian propaganda using this video uh, uh, in a short, fragmented way uh, that was in, uh, posted on the internet. Uh, they published m 
murals, how we reacted to uh, to this and how we pre presented informational campaign. Uh, our center found uh, the woman and her husband. We um, recorded an interview uh, discussing the thesis of the Russian propaganda, and this video was um, uh, published by uh, Ukrainian media. Uh, so we wanted to uh, present the real story of that Ukrainian woman. Uh, so our center helped organize the interview, uh, also for um, international uh, media. Uh, as a result, this image uh, of a woman with a red flag It was published um, also by the BBC. You can see the material on our in our slide. Uh, this uh, was named one of the best uh, investigative uh, uh, journalist materials of the of the year. Uh, also, a huge um, number of people watched the video. Uh, uh, the video was watched by over a million of viewers. Uh, speaking about uh, the pro proliferation of uh, Russian disinformation narratives. Uh, these were in, published within uh, certain Russian campaigns. Um, one of the media campaigns uh, was the reaction to um, the information of um, stealing military support uh, in Ukraine. So ostensibly um, the, the arms provided by the West to Ukraine uh, was stolen uh, and being being sold. Uh, we focused our uh, actions both internally and outside of Ukraine um, that indeed uh, the arms from the West is in safe hands. Um, we corrected the uh, accusations of stealing the uh, the military help, and we made it 100% uh, sure that um, the transfer of these arms, of the weapons, uh, was covered by um, reliable media outlets. Uh, we were supported by our media partners as well. Our messages were uh, proliferated by, by them as well. Um, and we created ten arguments based on uh, based on these um, materials. Another example is uh, how uh, Russian propaganda is working. Um, as much as in in um, in March uh, there was certain there was a certain embargo on Russian uh, media outlets. Some of the um, Western media um, outlets continued to uh, broadcast a propaganda message uh, for the Western audiences. Uh, uh, we wanted to stress that uh, it is really necessary to uh, use resources to make sure that the embargo is working and to stop Russian propaganda from uh, proliferating. We created two uh, analyses. In the first uh, one, we analy analyzed the content of Russian and um, uh, Russia Today uh, outlet. We wanted to show that uh, RT uh, poses a threat for the civilized world and it's worth blocking them. Uh, as a result of our um, research, firstly, RT uh, has been an info informational threat not only to Ukraine but also the whole world because the Russian uh, propaganda uses Russia today as a medium to spread propaganda uh, even before the full-scale invasion, uh, Russian invasion on Ukraine. The information uh, not only discredited Ukraine but also discredited democratic world and uh, various uh, international organizations. Um, and they even uh, 
during the COVID uh, pandemic, they um, they undermined also health um, aimed actions. In the second uh, analysis, we were showing the means that Russia today uh, wants to broadcast their narratives. And among the insights were that after the, the embargo, Russia today managed to um, use informal um, uh, means of communication. Uh, so they did not publish the information on their official websites, uh, r but rather than they used uh, social uh, media to spread the uh, disinformation. Uh, and they managed to do it uh, in the West. Irina, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough time. So if you could just with uh, in one minute uh, sum up what you'd like to uh, talk about uh, your research, and then we will uh, move on to our colleagues and, and give them the floor. Thank you. Yes, so uh, I have another example uh, about the Russian propaganda in not only Ukrainian or Russian uh, sphere, but also in the international uh, aspect. Uh, my uh, previous speakers have already touched um, upon this uh, international narratives um, a lot, so I won't be focusing on it too much. Uh, both in Europe and in North America, and in certain regions as well. Uh, I'd like to finish up that uh, thanks to common cooperation with all uh, international organizations, thanks to our military and uh, Ukrainian citizens, uh, we will uh, be victorious on the information front. Uh, our goal is to block um, propaganda websites. Um, we need a huge international support of Ukraine and to isolate the Russian Federation. Uh, as to the recommendations, uh, for content makers, uh, you should be speaking about the truth about um, the the war crimes of Russia that is happening in in, um, in Ukraine, and to give more voice to the experts, uh, also to uh, shed light on how the Russian propaganda works. Uh, we have enough material to share. Uh, we also have a lot of to be proud of. Uh, these are our materials that uh, you can look into the presentation and uh, uh, familiarize yourself with. Um, these are just part of the materials we have um, we have created within uh, the past week. Thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have yet another um, topic to, to discuss. What do, uh, what should content makers, bloggers uh, in Ukraine, and also Ukraine's um, the Ukrainian people outside Ukraine, what to do uh, so that uh, the support for Ukraine uh, was ev growing ever stronger? Uh, I'd like to give the floor to Marina Doros. Marina will uh, talk about um, the research on the internal. Um, uh, auditorium. Uh, obviously, we have uh, problems with you know communicating um, our um, information outside Ukraine, but it's also important to focus on our internal uh, auditorium as well. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I've heard, um, I mean, I have a lot of reflections on today, but I understand that we have uh, a very tight agenda. How many minutes do I have left, Julia? Uh, okay, let's let's have a bargain here. Uh, let's try seven minutes, shall we? Sure. Uh, so I will tell you just one fourth of what I wanted to say. So altogether, uh, the auditorium in the, our auditorium Uh, you know probably what I'm doing, uh, dealing with, but if you don't, um, 
I'm responsible for media literacy, and I've been doing it since uh, 2012. I work in IREX organization uh, on media literacy. Since 2015, uh, we have been working on uh, expanding media literacy in the broad um, sphere. This is a big part of our project um, deals with um, media li literacy in um, uh, official edu education uh, and also tertiary uh, education at universities. I think you're interested who is uh, who carries out such programs and, pro uh, and projects in media literacy uh, in practice. Is it true that people after trainings and after some information campaign, can they really identify false information? Uh, can they identify these narratives of Russia propaganda, which happen in various different formats? Uh, here we have some um, data. Uh, we have um, our um, uh, own research within our target groups. And um, our insights are that um, the self-assessment of a, of a person, how to recognize fake news, is higher than in reality. Uh, it's a very traditional situation that uh, we ask a person to assess themselves whether they can uh, recognize fake news. They say yes, but when we directly ask them to do it in practice, the results are not as optimistic. I decided to speed up um, today's uh, my speech. So uh, there was an idea we uh, identified, we um, created t together with Filtr, uh, a project at the um, Ministry of Information Policy and IREX, and a project that I uh, re am responsible for, uh, the National Media Literacy Test. And we carried out a, a national uh, media literacy test. We have this discussion whether to call it a, an exam, but we decided to call it a test. Um, here you can see the test uh, structure, um, which was consist uh, which consisted of um, five blocks, which included thirty four questions. Um, it lasted thirty minutes. Block one. And uh, I guess there was just less than one minute for a question. Uh, yes, it, it required 30 minutes. Uh, we created uh, time slots that uh, you could use to um, go through the test uh, because we wanted to uh, avoid people cheating. S starting with basic concepts, uh, what media literacy and information space is ending up with uh, really practical uh, issues like an analyzing um, uh, social media um, posts and media materials. Uh, what's uh, important is that in this case, our case and filters uh, aim was uh, so that more people pass this test uh, of a really varied group so that people won't see it in uh, on Facebook or on uh, on their email boxes uh, that they wanted to uh, to take part in this text. Uh, we had over 32,000 people who tried to take this test and 17 and a half uh, managed to complete uh, the test. So they also got certificates after passing. Uh, there's some brief uh, breakdown uh, by age. As you see, most uh, respondents are the audience, the category that we call youth, uh, according to some uh, regulations. But uh, maybe it's because it was uh, this inf information about this test was uh, mainly spread by Facebook. Uh, well, uh, since the Ministry of Informational Policy was one of the partners of this test, they spread this uh, information on all the platforms they could. Uh, so, uh, as for the gender breakdown, most of the respondents were women, 
about 76 percent so they are the ones who like tests uh, we normally well of course we didn't target that on women but it's just what we had and here you can see the uh, percentage of people who got uh, you know different levels of media literacy so 44 percent are beginners 42 percent almost a guru and uh, uh, Nine um, percent is the media literacy guru. So it was really interesting uh, to identify those categories. But for us, uh, what was interesting for us was the result that I think might be also interesting for people making content uh, where they integrate some media literacy things. Uh, the hardest question was the identification of the facts and judgments. Only 10% of participants uh, identified all judgments. So that's when they had a few options and they should identify which of them was the judgment. Uh, we had a lot of discussions and at first we thought that was a really easy task, but now we realize that we still have uh, a lot of things to do. And 65% uh, participants identified uh, IPSO correctly and uh, also gave theoretically correct uh, answer. It's really interesting fact now when finding uh, a judgment, identifying a judgment was easier than identifying a fake. Uh, also 68% uh, identified some manipulative content, but there are some none that positive uh, results. So, this slide has those worst results. We see that uh, 34 persons didn't identify the hate speech. And the service that we have within our project for students and teachers, they also acknowledge this uh, tendency that people hardly identify hate speech, discrimination, and stereotypes and taking into account uh, the uh, ongoing disinformation operations of Russia that aim at uh, the split division of the society, uh, we should pay more attention to that and uh, spread that information in our materials. Also, 13% only were able to identify propaganda techniques and it was unexpected for us. I think that's the topic that we can highlight in the format of blogs and some entertainment content because uh, there we can use some humor and uh, only 21% of respondents were able to identify the signs of manipulative news. Uh, well, many people can identify that when, uh, well, in general, in theory, but when they see an example, then it gets harder. So I will not uh, tell more about the things that we do, but the only message I'd like to share is that now making the content aimed at uh, raising awareness and uh, media literacy, we should pay attention to how many uh, people are traumatized in society and how many triggers there can be that were not there before. So the perception of information changes, the emotions uh, resulting from it uh, change, and I think people working with big audiences, influencers, they, they should get deeper into that topic into how mental health uh, has changed now in terms of percepting, perceiving the information as well. I'd like to comment on this 34% uh, uh, parameter. I'm not surprised because I also am an active Twitter user and I realize where the other 66% people come from, those who cannot realize where propaganda is. So you should pay attention to that as well. 
I think that my colleagues Olga and Talona will have the highest responsibility because I'd like to ask them how, about how well we, we've learned a lot today about what government uh, authorities do in Ukraine, what colleagues, international and Ukrainian colleagues uh, recommend us how to be efficient in combating the disinformation and those operations, but also to make the support to Ukrainian uh, get higher or at least stay on the same level if we talk about those content makers. So Olga, what do you think we should do? That's an interesting question because I was not prepared to answer that. I have to say that today we tried You know, I'm a co-founder of the Stop Fake project, uh, acting on debunking Russian uh, propaganda since 2014. We've, we're studying those Russian narratives. And uh, today, for the whole day, we've been trying to, uh, you know, to take uh, this, uh, this problem from different uh, aspects. And uh, so we're the one who deals with those fakes directly. And I encourage you to visit our Stop Fake website. It's translated into different languages, European ones, uh, the Turkish one. And we also uh, planned, uh, plan to spread our website to different countries that were mentioned today. So how those narratives are made, how they operate, we study all that. And when we were approaching the full uh, invasion, we realized how those approaches worked and how those narratives were formed. Uh, so they like articulated the image of Ukraine as a failed state. Uh, they made the image of Ukrainians as uh, Nazis for different uh, countries, specifically the Western audience, because they are really sensitive to things like that. And so we had a lot of demands for it, such, uh, uh, such information, and Russia uh, fulfilled that demand. There were also some messages targeted at Ukrainian uh, audience, and it's really worth mentioning because uh, we speak a lot about the foreign audiences, but Ukrainian audience should be worked with a lot because there were also some narratives uh, for Ukrainians that our reforms don't work, that our government is bad, and it's not always the case. And so the bigger the reform was, the more narratives uh, about how bad it was we had. Uh, starting February 24, uh, those same narratives uh, kept being injected, but the essence of propaganda changed and it became like a full-scale war uh, propaganda uh, whose main aim was to get the victory in the war. And that is what we have now. There are five basic audiences, Ukrainian people, Ukrainian soldiers, Russian people, Russian soldiers, and the international society. And so speaking about Russia, their main um, aim is uh, this hate. And uh, it's been uh, built already. And now the main goal of propaganda is to maintain that hate. Although now uh, this uh, this narrative has changed a bit during the past year, and now there is this interesting narrative about being in a submarine in Russia. So if we have to drone, then we should do that all together. And it's interesting because the same narrative was during the Second World War by the Hitler's propaganda when they began losing, which means there is the good sign. Uh, as for the Ukrainian uh, target audience, the main message was the desire to split, to divide the country by different signs, the language, uh, those who left and those who stayed. Yeah, so it's 
great that we have this discussion. So the family chiefs, so different uh, things were used by propaganda. And so we should realize that there are some things that we like arguing about, but uh, Russian trolls also use that to uh, deepen our um, disagreements. And so now there is this undermining of different Russian propaganda videos. Maybe you've seen those. They, they refer to different things about how people, how men are uh, recruited right on the streets and go to the military. So there are things like that. So now there is this narrative that uh, defending uh, your own country is something that should be avoided. And we should realize uh, this narrative as well. Because like their aim is for less people to go to war and for country to lose its uh, defense potential. So that's what Russia uses. As for international uh, society, other than those um, narratives that we've already discussed, that Ukrainian government can't be trusted, that it's a corrupted uh, country, that Russia is much longer and there is no sense in supporting Ukraine. So now there is the new message, uh, which is also spread in Ukraine as well. This is this matter question of fatigue, of like, let's have peace. And it's also uh, quite uh, difficult because peace on the Russian uh, Russia's conditions is not what we want. Uh, so what should bloggers or influencers do about this? We have to, well, the world doesn't know much about us, although it has learned a lot about us for the past year, but it's still not enough. So we should create this context in all aspects, starting from uh, the history, uh, from this uh, colonization uh, history, and then go into the concept of war and peace. What, like, when they ask us, when Western uh, countries ask us why we don't want peace, we should say that we want peace, but we don't want occupation because occupation is even uh, more horrible than war. And you know, many Western countries don't realize that because they didn't have that experience. And so that's the framework we should uh, spread and promote because this is how we see the world and the life. And uh, only uh, one narrative can fight another narrative. Uh, although, yeah, so I can say that it's not enough only to fight propaganda or disinformation. We should also uh, promote our views, our framework. Uh, which uh, like create another image uh, different than what Putin creates. And another thing is explanation of how uh, propaganda works. Uh, you know, the examples presented earlier, they showed how important it is to explain to people how propaganda works, because now this its role is much bigger than in all other wars before it was just uh, it has just a you know supporting function and now it's one of the key functions that's why people should know how it works because uh, if they are aware it means they have the arms yeah so we should promote media literacy we should debunk fakes we should uh, uh, discover the narratives and promote our own framework since you have your own audience and maybe it's not reached by anyone else, that's the audience you should work with because Russia pays a lot of money to in invest a lot of money into propaganda, into working with small audiences. Maybe we don't have that money, but we have a will to win and that is what we should do. Thank you for the attention. You know what kind of task we have before us. Um, you, you wanted to talk about Nota Yenota, why the name? Not only about your Nota Yenota, but I understand that I wanted to present my um, 
insights, but I wanted to, sh to talk about one anecdote. Yes, I understand. Uh, I have a presentation. Could you turn it on? My name is Elena Romaniuk. I'm a fact checker by profession. Uh, I'm responsible for a few projects in uh, disinformation in this field. I've been working since 2017. Uh, before that, I had worked in PR journalism. So, bless you. Uh, mm, the history. So my um, presentation, you can see, is about um, this animal, about raccoon. Uh, before that, I had a project about um, fighting fake news, um, and I wanted to grow. So I wanted to. So I was always introduced to. Uh, different types of trainings to a wide audience. Um, I thought it's not a proper format. Um, so even when uh, such um, trainings are really practical, but in fact they, uh, for a bigger audience, were not not too practical. In terms of fact checking. And when you talk about uh, journalists, um, social activists, it's a very specialized uh, audience. But in terms of the wide audience, we need different formats. This is why um, I created this um, idea of a um, an, an interactive game, uh, brainstorming uh, session, this kind of thing. Uh, I wanted to find a, a symbol and a name so that it was r r quickly identifiable. I wanted to make it a little bit uh, naughty, a little bit funny. Um, so I came up with the idea with a raccoon. Uh, uh, this uh, idea has not been present in uh, the media sphere at, at all. Um, there is a mission behind raccoons, is to save uh, the raccoon from the Russian occupation. You understand that they intercept that in, in, in reality Russians intercepted a raccoon from a Ukrainian zoo. So we need to rescue it. Uh, metaphorically. Uh, the name, um, my, my husband helped me, um, came up with uh, with the name. Um, so the name of, n not the name, not a, not a, is a, is a rhyming um, word game um, on a raccoon and, uh, and a note. Uh, I first came up with the idea on um, one of the festivals in the w in the west of Ukraine. So I thought that um, this um, anti-fake news game, um, I came up with it as an answer to uh, the audience of young people who um, need a an additional incentive to take part in such an activity. So I organized such games for the filter organization and I um, on the 24th of, of January I wanted to um, to carry out one of the uh, installments of this uh, initiative but obviously I uh, did not fulfill this uh, project for obvious reasons, uh, so I, um, I couldn't leave the area of, of, uh, of Kyiv um, and I was left with, um, uh, with activists who had active, uh, um, access to uh, Viber chats. So I cannot really um, quantify this this story but my chat history with uh, people from uh, from the area of uh, Dnipro so that my key message is to go the way go with your uh, audience 
um, and to choose the, um, the channels of communication and speak the language of uh, your target group. Uh, so, dear bloggers, please use Viber as your as your outlets. Uh, indeed, um, the fakes. I created a typology of fake news. We carried out um, a research um, called information uh, attack of Russian Ukrainian uh, war. It's discreditation of uh, of the society, of the military. Uh, for example, some information that uh, they uh, some four um, uh, boroughs of of a city was uh, was liberated, or very often we can hear some um, uh, fake news, uh, some gossip about uh, the attack on the Belarusian side. So we are surrounded by these fake news. Um, so I created this typology for Arex um, and ambassadors in uh, local communities. Uh, I also worked with, for um, uh, Opora organization. Moving on, um, this is one of our um, key points, uh, propaganda aimed at um, creating information chaos to discredit uh, our military, our army, um, our media. They try to demoralize the society for us so that we uh, lose the faith to win. Moving on, we don't have much time. Um, this is another um, image on um, the lies of the Putin. Um, we create. We received a lot of uh, requests uh, to identify the lies of Vladimir Putin. Um, he very often um, lies about the history, um, the society, the news in Ukraine. I didn't see much. Uh, sense in doing so because it's all lies. Uh, we understand that um, everybody understands that Russia is evil, but we lack arguments to prove it. At the beginning of the full scale invasion, volunteers uh, worked uh, really hard and translated our website in, uh, in, into English. Um, I was contacted by people from abroad, uh, America, uh, Switzerland as well. Uh, for this forum, I needed to show not a nota uh, is based on uh, firstly fact checking. There is a rule: if you don't want to do something, don't do it. Uh, this is what I uh, teach as a lecturer. Uh, if you, um, my idea is you cannot. Uh, prove somebody wrong if you see it. Uh, it's just a must. You you just have to do it. Uh, there is a, there are a lot of groups on Facebook. Uh, for example, about people who um, who are missing due to the war. These groups uh, are extremely popular. You can see that our. Um, Uh, all our posts are really organic, without any um, advertising. So um, proving um, proving fake news is is really popular. Uh, narrative is really a frame. So in psychology we call it uh, we have a term reframing. So in order to show that uh, something is a lie, we need to go beyond the frame. When it comes to nota y nota, when we, so to speak, understood that uh, we are at war, it was the summer, and I saw a notice about the media accelerator, accelerator from Getter Institute. Um, I wanted to work with games. I understood that I cannot reach every city, uh, although I have a lot of invitations. So my idea was that everybody could uh, use these games in uh, in their local uh, areas, so to create a, a tool for them. Uh, so these questions I always had in mind that it should be based on uh, case studies. 
so we decided to work on base of propaganda case studies, fake news. So I won this media accelerator, we created a website. Right now we see over 200 games, uh, or tasks rather, uh, over 430 participants took part in the game. Uh, I invited, uh, or I would like to invite uh, teachers. So what are we doing? This website, maybe later I will show you this, it is divided into sections. Each section, all these questions, are not based on a question and answer. So the task on the side of the teacher or the leader of the group is the answer is provided after participants provide their own answers so that they can uh, learn themselves. So the teacher shows what should be borne in mind, what factors need to be taken into consideration when formulating an answer. Uh, we're not only um, proving lies, but we're also uh, debunking myths. Uh, for example, that you can um, cure cancer with sodium. Uh, or there were many myths surrounding uh, COVID. Uh, you're left with two minutes only, sorry about that. Uh, yes, starting on Monday, um, we'll be collecting um, submissions in terms of the rounds of the game, Uh, they are divided into truth or uh, lie. Um, we have uh, different type of uh, quizzes, games. Um, we suggest uh, we suggest um, that the participants uh, translate uh, lies into truth. Uh, okay, let's play. Just one minute, please. Uh, this is a photo that uh, Russian propaganda shared um, in October. It shows a woman um, with, um, with bags. It shows as if um, this journalist is not really taking part in real actions, but it's, it's a staged uh, situation. Okay, if this is October, it's not really true because, yeah, because he's, there, there are no leaves on um, uh, on the trees, and he's not, and the journalist is not in the trenches, so this possibly cannot be a true picture, it must be fake. So uh, now we've also creating the uh, preparing the exhibition. Uh, it's the XR exhibition. Um, it's uh, organized by a few partners. This is also about how the propaganda works. There will be uh, 30 billboards uh, about different uh, so-called news facts and I will share it later. Also, we have this TV project called The Anatomy of Lie. And also there is this slide. So this is just for Poland to know. We've recently published some fake narratives of Russia in Poland. So when Russia says that they did nothing wrong with for, for Polish people to hate uh, Russia. So here's this meme saying that we used to hate Russia even before the war. Uh, thank you. And so everyone's waiting for the moment when we call it a night. I'd like to sum it up. Everything we've heard today will definitely be useful for creating content. And I'd like to highlight a few things. 
uh, first we uh, do need to uh, speak the truth and uh, fight uh, Russian uh, lie with Ukrainian truth. We should spread our narratives uh, as much as possible and we should go where audience is, uh, where they are waiting. If we don't do that, our informational enemies will do that, so that's what we have to do. I'm really thankful to our translators for such a complicated pass. They've come today with us because we were speaking a lot and too fast. I thank you. Uh, let's applaud to them. And uh, finally, I'll switch to English. Unfortunately or fortunately, I'm switching to English to invite Ashken Grigorian to tell a couple of words for us, uh, just a closing and summing up for our Influencers Hub Ukraine, uh, three rounds of uh, incubators we had with them. And again, uh, many thanks to DCN Global for making it real. Many thanks to the U.S. Um, embassy in Kyiv, Ukraine, and America House for huge support and continuous support. So you heard in the beginning that America House is always open for us. So please uh, take use of it. And Ash, the floor is yours. Thank you, my dear. So I'm not going to keep you here for long. Only thanks to everyone. I am very happy that I have the chance. I have the. I have had the privilege to manage the Influencers Hub Ukraine project. I'm very happy to get to know you. I'm very happy that we are doing all this together and I'm sure that we are going to continue. Uh, once again, from my side also, very much thanks to our funders, the US Embassy in Ukraine. They have been the most support for us. Very huge thank you, thanks to goes to America Houses in Odessa, in uh, Kiev. We have been working very closely and we hope to continue the work also in the coming years. A lot of thanks to our, on behalf of DCN global team, to all of you, to the experts, to international experts, Ukrainian experts who have made it and who have brought their efforts, time and knowledge to make all the hub and the process of the hub successful. Uh, a lot of thanks goes to our team, the production team, who has been with us uh, throughout the, the two uh, events that we have done. A lot of thanks goes to our Polish AV produ uh, production team, so who helped us here to make this happen. Thanks goes to the, to, to the interpreters, Nestor and Ghana, who have been very uh, patient with us to stay with us longer. And I have two small announcements. One is for the people who will be staying here for the for uh, President Biden uh, meeting. So uh, we will also share this information in the in the channel. So you are all invited on February 21. On the, it is an open ceremony, and uh, President Biden will be speaking there, and Zelensky is also going to be there. So please share to your networks as well. So uh, Julia will share the information. And another uh, opportunity, so recently DCN Global has got into partnership with Cambridge Disinformation Summit, which is happening in uh, June. And uh, we are privileged to provide uh, free uh, spots to our Ukrainian uh, and DCN Global uh, network. This information also will go to you. So. Uh, you will be able to receive free tickets uh, on behalf of DCN Global to attend online as uh, uh, the, the event, which is quite big, which is going to be very big in June. So, and, and I'm not taking longer time, so thank you very much. And of course, I, uh, last but not least, I have to thank also our very close partners and the friends and... Uh, uh, World learning is behind, and uh, world learning is has been behind uh, the back of DCN from the beginning, and it con continues to be our most appreciated partner and supporter. Thank you to everyone attending. Thank you to those who are online as well. Thanks a lot, and enjoy the evening. Thank you so much, and glory to Ukraine, of course.
Thank you very much. Heroim Slava. So one more thing. We need to say bye-bye to uh, those who are watching us online and keep calm for like three, four seconds afterwards. And afterwards, I will tell you one more thing. So thank you for being with us. Yeah, it's intriguing, I know, but uh, it's only for those who are here, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening and keep calm and fighting for freedom in Ukraine.